Uh, we are in uh, Acts chapter 7. And uh, uh, Acts chapter 7 contains the single longest recorded sermon in the entire book of Acts. That's interesting uh, because Luke actually wasn't there to hear it himself. Uh, so he, but we know from Luke, if you read Luke's gospel, he only uses eyewitness accounts. So where did he get this account? And the answer is from the Apostle Paul because Paul is an alias of a name that he used, he used to have a different name, and that's Saul from Tarsus. And Saul was present for this event that is described. And we're not going to read through the entire chapter of uh, uh, 7 because of Acts, because it, it would just take a little bit long today. So I'm going to, to look at some specific areas towards the end of the chapter. Um, I think that a lot of us uh, get anxious about the life that we're living, and what I want you to know is uh, there's, there's something called fear of missing out. I think that it is really possible to miss a lot of life, but we have to redefine how we think about life, and life is not how many breaths you breathe or how many times your heart beat. It's what kind of life you live with the time that you have. And we're introduced to an individual named Stephen who didn't live very long, but he made an incredible difference. There's two truths that we're confronted with in this passage, and uh, they're, they're true whether we acknowledge them or even are aware of them or not. And the first is this. Uh, you are being shaped by something or someone. You're not a self-made, self-perpetuating person. Uh, the second truth is that you are shaping something or someone. You are not a person without influence. And those two truths are uh, undeniable once you have understanding of a spiritual reality. But our world constantly confronts those things. So we're going to begin at what is the end of the story. Uh, Stephen is, has given his message and things are not going well. So in Acts chapter 7, verse 54, it says, when the members of the Sanhedrin, that's the group responsible for the trial, heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And at this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices. They all rushed at him. D does anybody get the impression that these people would have fit right into our culture? Like they, would have, they would have been on TV for sure. They dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Well, let me go back to 57. They covered their ears, yelling at the top of their voices. They all rushed at him. They dragged him out of the city, began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. And while they were stoning him, G Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, Receive my spirit. And then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Um, I've never given a message where when I was done, people rushed me and beat me senseless. And I'm hoping we get through one more day. We're being shaped by forces they can be visible, they can be invisible. We're all being shaped by something and into something. For example, your family of origin had a shaping influence in your life. Say, so, no, I'm nothing like them. Well, if you're nothing like them, that means that you didn't like a lot about them and you decided to be different from them, which means they had a shaping influence in your life. You're shaped by the books that you read. You're shaped by the friends that you have. You're shaped by the schools that you attend, the neighborhoods you live in, the places that you work. Scripture reveals that there's another thing that can shape our lives, and it's grace. That pain and suffering can shape us, but pain and suffering can also reveal to us what else has shaped us. This is a very powerful truth. And grace-shaped people respond differently in situations in life. So the first thing I'd like you to know this morning is that grace shaping takes time. It's not just add water and stir and you're all good to go. When you look at Stephen, you see an individual, it's kind of interesting, between chapter 6 and chapter 7, several years have gone by. 
We're not giving a day-by-day account. This isn't a journal of the church, but some highlights. And earlier we had seen that Stephen was one of the seven people who had been selected to serve tables, but he discovered that he didn't just have to serve tables, that he could serve people. And through the years of doing that ministry, he developed some very powerful communication skills. And he discovered that when he prayed, God would hear and answer his prayers. And so he had developed quite an interesting ministry. As a result of his ministry and miracles that he was doing, he's on trial, literally on trial. He's not just going through a trial. And he's charged with these uh, basic criminal activities. They said that he spoke blasphemous words against God, against Moses, and against the temple. Now, what does blaspheme mean? Does that mean just disrespectful words? And it's, it's much deeper than that. To blaspheme doesn't just mean that you're disrespectful of. To blaspheme means that you're undermining or eroding, or the concept is actually reversing spiritual and moral influence. That's what they accused him of doing. You are reversing the spiritual and moral influence in our culture. So he's brought to trial. It's to the Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin considered, it was, consisted of 71 religiously trained scholars. These were rabbis. These were individuals that had spent a lot of their life searching and learning scripture. And so they, they put him on trial. And by the way, there's some false witnesses that are brought in. What's also interesting is that they describe in their ex, uh, experience of him, they said he had the face of an angel. So what does that mean? He had the face of an angel. Well, if you've been around our culture for very long, angels are usually depicted as chubby little babies. They're pretty happy. Yes? Yeah, that's not what an angel looks like in the Bible. And so he's not just looking sweet. He's actually showing something of God's glory on his his countenance. And they're rather stunned by this. And so... He begins to respond to the charges, and if you read through it, it sounds like he's just giving a history lesson, but that's not what he's doing. He's building a theological foundation. And he's he's going after this idea that he's attacked the temple. And so this is his response. He says, Abraham, who is the founder and father of our faith, heard God calling him out when he lived in Mesopotamia, and he was not in a temple when that happened. Then he goes on. Joseph was actually rejected by his brothers. They sold him into human trafficking, slavery, and he wound up in Egypt where he heard the voice of God and was used powerfully to rescue his brothers and his people. There was no temple there for him to hear God. And Moses, who was rejected by his own countrymen, he'd been raised in Egypt, And he was raised in Pharaoh's house, and he saw uh, a, a, a slave driver injuring one of the Israelites, and he rose up against him, and he killed him. And, uh, and, and he buried him in the sand, and, and the next day he saw two Israelites fighting each other, and he says, why can't you just get along? And the guy said, what are you going to do, kill me like you did the Egyptian? And he thought that was a secret, and so he just took off and he ran to the land of Midian as far away as he could get from anything. And in the faraway place of Midian, he heard the voice of God in a burning bush, which was not a temple. Uh, Stephen is going after something here. Attempts to limit God are actually attempts to control God. What you want to do is to say the only thing God can do is in a temple. And you know from your own history, look at the theology. God has not been limited to temples. See, creating space to invite God to work is a good thing. Suggesting it's the only place God can work is a harmful thing. He even quotes Isaiah 66, which basically says this, God refuses to be under house arrest. You can't contain him in a building. It's not possible. So our great temptation is not to deny 
that God exists. Our great temptation is to replace God. And what was happening is they were actually replacing God with a building. And he, he makes reference to another story. And the story is uh, after the Israelites had come out of the land of bondage, Moses is up on top of, of the mountain receiving the commandments. He's been gone for quite a while. They're getting a little restless. They go to Aaron, who kind of serves as the religious leader. And they said, we need a God to lead us, so make one. And so they, they, they made a contribution of gold earrings that they had. Aaron puts it this way. He said, I put the gold into the fire and out came this calf. It, it's not exactly how it was, but, and there's this golden calf. Stephen is referring to the story on purpose. He's making a connection, just like they made a golden calf to replace God. You've made a building to replace him. This was very unsettling to them. And Stephen, while being bold, was still not malicious. When you look at his words, they are direct, and he's dealing with the realities that they are presenting, but he's not malicious, he's not disrespectful, he's not unkind. Even when he's being executed by the mob, he doesn't break out into a rant. In fact, what he did was he saw something nobody else was seeing, and he said something nobody else was saying. It's the other side that was showing unrestrained anger. And unrestrained anger is a natural response when our idol is threatened. I think this is a point of some considerable self-examination. Whatever makes you maddest might reveal something you've put in the place of God in your life when it's attacked. And you should understand, it starts with the very first command. God will not tolerate other gods before him. That's not just because he's a jealous God and he feels threatened by having other gods around. It's because he knows that when we worship anything but him, we become like what we worship, and it's not what we think it is. So the Sanhedrin reached the boiling point. They clenched their teeth. They dragged Stephen out of the room. They dragged him out of the city. They picked up and hurled stones at him with deadly force. And, you know, I can understand someone being so angry that they throw a stone. Um, I really don't understand picking up stone after stone after stone and continue to throw them until the person is lifeless. I hit a person with a stone one time. It wasn't on purpose. Well, I mean, so I was throwing the stone at the person. I really didn't think I could hit him. It was a flat stone, and I threw it, and it arced way out and came in like a heat-sicking missile and dropped my friend in the middle of a field, and the thought never occurred to me, I should get another stone. <laughs> I was immediately, immediately challenged by what I had done and deeply afraid of punishment that could come. What kind of religion is it that keeps picking up stones and hurling them with deadly force until a person is lifeless? And the answer is man-made religions. That's what kind of religion does that, man-made religions. That's what comes from worshiping something other than the living God. If we want to sound different in our culture, we need to see something different. If we want to sound different in our culture, we need to see something different. And Stephen does. He sees the glory of God. He sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And when he shares what he sees, it only makes the attackers even angrier. But what he's seeing is Jesus at the right hand of God. And he is for Stephen. And this is what's great. When you know Jesus is for you, it doesn't much matter who else is against you. That's what mattered most to Stephen. And I wonder what matters most to us, because God is for you. So on that day, there's a man standing there. His name is Saul, and he's being significantly shaped by a man named Stephen. The leader of persecution against the church was actually trying to shape the world through force and through violence. He's going to go on a terror where he arrests Christians, he puts them on trial, and he consents to their death. He's got legal authority to do it. And he thinks that's how he's going to shape the world. But the person who seems to have no power had the biggest influence because grace is disproportionate in its influence. That's how it works. So God wants to shape you, and God wants to shape the world around you through you. People are the method that God uses. 
This is what he's decided he will do in our world. And he's not just using anyone, not just good people. He's looking for people who learn to function in the dimensions of life that Jesus has made available. We need to be shaped by something greater than our disappointments and the injustices of our world. I, please don't, don't misunderstand me right now. My heart is broken by the things that I see in our world and in our culture. When I see injustice, it breaks my heart, and I know it breaks the heart of God. But if we are only shaped by our disappointments and injustice, we will become people we do not recognize. And we will do things we can't imagine we would do. We need something greater than our disappointments and injustice to shape the people we are becoming. And that's what grace can do. We can be shaped by grace. We can be filled with God's spirit. We can be filled with God's wisdom. And I'm not just talking about a one-time event where back in some day we experienced something, but an ongoing, refreshed reality of who God is in our life. Are you full of grace? and God's spirit right now. Now, our world cannot achieve a healthy uh, outcome through an unhealthy option. Um, this is how the world usually works, how it usually thinks. If I can get other people to do what I want, the world will be better. It actually doesn't work very well. There are people who are getting what they want. Well, we just need different people. I, I don't think you understand the human condition. It's a misassumption. It's actually, actually serving others that shapes you and the world around you. That's how Stephen starts. He's making sure the most vulnerable in the community get enough to eat. Expecting to be served, demanding to be served, that can make you unshapeable. Very hard. Very proud. It's not a good way to live. So Stephen's accusers, the accomplices in murder, they couldn't tolerate a voice that, was, that didn't agree with them. And they drag him out of a religious place and they drag him out of a city. And they're not just resisting a person right then. Scripture reveals they're resisting God's spirit right then. And there's something that happens in the death of Stephen. It's really remarkable. When Stephen is, is being killed, what we discover is there's a lot of similarities between his death and the death of Christ. Both were tried by the Sanhedrin. Both had to appear before the high priest. Both had the experience of false witnesses coming forward and making false statements against them. Both were charged with blasphemy. Both were accused of making threats against the temple. Both committed their spirits to God as they were dying. Both asked forgiveness for their enemies. Stephen had been completely shaped by Jesus so that even in the worst moment of his life, he reflects our Savior. We get frustrated about where we are in life. What I'd like you to know is that God is far more interested in the person you are becoming than where you are located. And if you're waiting to be somewhere that you perceive as a better option to be the kind of influence that you desire, what I would want you to know is God intends to use you right where you are. Faith will argue against your feelings. Some people think that faith is all about feelings. It really isn't. Some of the biggest confrontation of your feelings will come through faith. If all we do is operate by feelings, we'll be tended to tap out when we're tired or take someone out when we're angry. And that's not a grace-shaped life. Faith says this isn't easy. It's not going the way I expected, but I believe God is in this with me. And I believe I can be shaped by grace. And I believe he will use me in this moment, in this place, to make a difference in someone else's life. Let's bow our heads this morning.
uh, I don't know a more relevant message for our culture than Acts chapter 7. I don't know a more inspiring person for our world right now than Stephen. I think somehow we have to learn to take a step back from those who would seek to manipulate us for their own purposes. They can try to make us afraid. And, and by the way, this is not a, a conservative or progressive thing. Everyone is pushing the fear buttons right now. So who in your life is pushing the grace button? Who in your life is helping you to know that where you are is not nearly as important as the work that God is doing in your heart? And that if you are shaped by grace, it doesn't matter how many breaths you have left. It matters with the ones, what you're doing with the ones that you have right now. That God intends to make a difference in our world by his grace through your life shaped by grace heavenly father um, there's so many forces so much pressure so much tension in our world that would seek, seek to to shape us into something that is unrecognizable to us would you help us to surrender to the influence of grace because we know what that looks like it looks like jesus we thank you for that today, in Jesus' name. So here's what I'd like you to do, okay? I'd like you all to stand, and we'll put these back on for right now, okay? And this is what I want you to do. I want you to think of a situation or an individual that is frustrating you right now. They're making your life a little annoying, okay? You thought of somebody like that? Okay. What I want you to do is put your hand out like this right in front of you. And I want you to repeat these words, right? Grace to you. Let's say it, ready? Grace to you. Let's try it one more time. Grace to you. When, when somebody cuts you off on the 490, roll down your window, stick your head out, and yell at the top of your lungs, Grace to you! I promise they haven't heard anything like that. Grace to you. Grace to the people who are frustrating you. And then I want you to think of someone who has wronged you right now. Hands still out, and I'd like you to say this. Father, Father, let's say it together, ready? Father, do not hold this sin against them. I choose to forgive them. In Jesus' name, amen.